All right. Well, great. Um, we'll be getting started now. Uh, thank you all for joining us this morning. My name is Albert Fox Khan. I'm the Executive Director of the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project. And with me here today is our Advocacy Associate, Fabian Rogers. And we're really excited to talk with you a bit about the Privacy New York slate of legislation and the coalition that is pushing these bills forward. Uh, Privacy New York came together earlier this, uh, earlier this year to push comprehensive privacy protections at the state and local level here in New York. We have more than two dozen members, including organizations like the New York Immigration Coalition, uh, the Legal Aid Society, uh, Access Now, uh, and of course, our own organization, the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project. We want to highlight a few of our priorities for the coming uh, year, uh, but of course, we want to keep this interactive to address your questions as they come up. Uh, so please don't hesitate to uh, ask any questions using the Q&A uh, form at the bottom of your screen. Uh, before we get to the legislation that we're hoping to uh, see uh, lawmakers enact in the coming year, we wanted to address two bills that were already enacted. Uh, Senate Bill 8450 slash Assembly Bill 10500, which uh, will protect contact tracing data, and Senate Bill 5140 slash Assembly Bill 6787 which prevent, uh, prevents the use of facial recognition in schools. Both of these bills were passed by the uh, state lawmakers. Both of these bills are awaiting the governor's signature. And we would really urge your offices to reach out to the governor to continue to put pressure on him to enact these vital reforms. Uh, we believe that facial recognition poses a unprecedented uh, civil rights threat to New Yorkers, particularly students of color. And as we see the transition to remote learning, bringing facial recognition into the privacy of students' bedrooms, we think it's even more crucial that we enact this state ban on facial recognition. Uh, again, this was passed into, uh, this was enacted by both chambers. And, and so we think that it is quite crucial that these bills be uh, uh, signed by the governor. We'll uh, copy both uh, bill numbers uh, into the chat. Just give me one moment. Um, uh, one second. Zoom, of course, as always, is uncooperative. I got you covered. Thank you so much, Fabian. Um, and so again, if you could join us in calling on the governor to enact uh, these two bills, to sign them into law, you know, we, we think the facial recognition ban for schools is quite urgent, but the contact tracing privacy protections is particularly urgent. You know, we see a second wave uh, unfolding here in New York and trust is indispensable to effective community-based contact tracing. Uh, that's why it was so urgent that uh, privacy protections be enacted. Uh, and, and they were overwhelmingly over the summer because in the absence of new laws, currently police or ICE can obtain contact tracing data with a simple subpoena, not even a warrant. Uh, and, and you know, with the proliferation of contact tracing apps, which gather even more granular and persistent location data uh, uh, on members of the public, it's even more urgent that this bill be signed into the law. Uh, you know, again, we, we ask your, for your support in calling for the governor to sign this bill immediately. Um, all right, uh, I see that we've had a couple other people join us. So just to uh, reiterate, please don't hesitate to ask questions as we go throughout this presentation. Uh, next, I'd like to turn to some of our priorities for the upcoming session. Uh, we think this is really an opportunity for New York to take a bold stance in enacting first in the country privacy protections, addressing some of the ways that ever more uh, powerful data systems are enabling police to target communities of color across New York and enabling ICE to target undocumented communities. First, we'd like to um, highlight um, a, a bill that we've been very involved with, uh, a geolocation tracking ban. Uh, um, we'll add those to the bill numbers for the Senate and the Assembly bills uh, into the chat. This is a measure that is introduced 
uh, in the Assembly by Dan Cord and then the Senate by Zellner Myrie. And it would be the first ban in the country on so-called geofence warrants. Geofence warrants allow a judge to issue a warrant, not for a single individual or a single phone, but it applies to everyone in a specified geofence area. That could be a single building, it could be an entire community, it could be an entire city. And we see real danger that this technology could be abused uh, to target political protests, to monitor sensitive sites, to monitor who attends a house of worship, who goes to Friday prayers at a mosque, and really that it is outside the scope of what should be uh, allowed by our constitution. There's currently litigation ongoing that might invalidate this practice in some jurisdictions, but we believe that legislation is indispensable, both in that it can be enacted more quickly, and also that it can go farther than some of the uh, uh, litigation can, because uh, the litigation is limited to the information that police obtain with a warrant, but uh, our bill goes further and actually bans uh, this information where it's purchased from data brokers, uh, vendors, and other third parties. Um, so we, again, urge you to, to um, uh, consider supporting this bill, to sign on if you haven't already as a co-sponsor, and help us build the momentum towards this first in the country ban on uh, mass location tracking. I'll, I'll pause there for questions, comments uh, on geofence warrants or on the legislation specifically. Uh, we know that some of these bills can get a bit technical, and so we definitely want to answer any questions as they arise. So I'll just pause for another moment. All right, uh, looks like we're good to go. Um, next, I uh, wanted to address the um, uh, need for uh, a ban on police drones. Uh, this is a bill that uh, uh, Representative uh, Ram Kim and Senator uh, Jessica Ramos uh, have introduced that would ban the use of police drones in New York State. We continue to see New York State uh, building a, a dubious track record as a leader in the use of drone technology with the use of our upstate drone corridor and um, the expanding use of drone technologies in New York City by the NYPD. In recent days, we saw the first example of the NYPD using a robotic dog as a land-based drone. And we have only have reason to fear that we'll continue to see drones uh, expanding uh, at, um, throughout the state. Drones, of course, uh, pose potent civil rights problems in that they reduce the cost of persistent aerial surveillance, making it easier and cheaper for police departments to surveil mass gatherings that pose no threat of criminal activity uh, and, and make it easier for police departments to target political protests and other demonstrations. We've seen evidence that um, NYPD drones have been used for surveilling uh, the, uh, uh, gay pride events and uh, for other mass political demonstrations where there's really no justification for that sort of invasive aerial surveillance. And we think it's uh, urgent that we uh, ban the technology before we see any expansion in the ability of these drones to deploy facial recognition and biometric tracking, uh, something that continues only to improve and again, build uh, even more uh, capacity for invasive mass surveillance. Um, so uh, again, would uh, appreciate your support on that legislation. Um, let me pause there, see if there are any questions about the drone legislation. All right. Continuing, and I apologize that you'll see there's a theme of really just uh, disturbing technologies being deployed in abusive and problematic ways throughout. Next, we wanted to address the uh, uh, the NYPD's use of an unofficial DNA database. Uh, as some of you may be aware, there is an official state DNA registry that was authorized by state law many years ago that has strict guidelines on how it can be used, when it can be used, and parameters for having DNA evidence retained in that database. 
Unfortunately, rather than abide by those existing uh, restrictions, we've see, seen the NYPD partner with the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner here in New York City to develop an unofficial or rogue DNA database that uh, includes the information on thousands of New Yorkers, including numerous children that have been tricked to provide their DNA evidence, um, whether it's by taking a piece of chewing gum or a soda from officers, and then having the discarded gum or discarded Coke can used to uh, put that individual in the DNA index. This means that someone can spend their entire life going through a uh, genetic lineup, constantly being uh, evaluated as a potential suspect, simply for uh, simply because they were once arrested or held uh, when they were younger. Uh, and keep in mind that while some DNA uh, testing can be incredibly accurate, we've also seen the growth of DNA testing uh, technologies that try to identify a purported match based off of incredibly small samples uh, using algorithmic ex extrapolation, increasing the risk of a potential error. A as a result, this could put uh, individuals who are wrongly arrested in their uh, youth at risk of wrongful arrest again and again throughout their life as a result. Um, and so we think it's quite uh, important that we ban the NYPD's um, rogue database and that we ensure that only the official uh, state database be uh, allowed to continue. Um, uh, happy to pause there for any questions as well. All right. Um, additionally, um, we uh, are continuing to prioritize the need to ban facial recognition uh, in New York State. Uh, there are several bills uh, pending currently that we uh, think would be an important addition uh, to uh, the current legislation banning facial recognition in schools. Uh, one uh, that I want to highlight is uh, S6776, uh, which would ban uh, the use of facial recognition in body cameras. Um, it, this is a particularly potent threat because, you know, we've seen body cameras sold to the public for a number of years as a police accountability tool, but if we allow facial recognition or other biometric tracking technologies to be integrated into body cameras, they'll go from being a police accountability uh, um, tool into a tool of mass surveillance. Uh, and, and as a result, we, we are quite concerned that this would fundamentally undermine the purpose of this uh, uh, technology. Um, and, and, oh, and, and yes, uh, uh, we will be happy to uh, provide a summary of all of this uh, at the conclusion of the meeting. And I also, um, Fabian, let's also include the link to the Privacy New York page on our website that includes a, a number of, of the, the write-ups of these bills already. We'll do. Yep. Uh, in addition to the uh, body cam bill, which would uh, mirror uh, AB 1215, a bill that was already enacted in California to ban the use of uh, facial recognition in conjunction with their body cameras, there's also a comprehensive uh, ban on law enforcement uh, facial recognition. Uh, that's uh, S7572 or A9767. Uh, and that would be an additional complement to that. Uh, it's, this is important because uh, while banning uh, facial recognition body cameras is uniquely important as, uh, for the reasons I just mentioned, uh, we also want to ensure that we're banning uh, the use of CCTV images, bystander images, or other images as part of a facial recognition program. It's really crucial to uh, emphasize that New York has one of the largest facial recognition programs anywhere in the country, according to a recent NYPD filing and litigation with our organization STOP. The NYPD used uh, facial recognition more than 22,000 times in just a, a three-year period, and the number only continues to grow. This technology has been repeatedly shown to be 
biased and error prone, especially for darker skinned women of color. And we also have seen higher error rates for non-binary individuals, for women, for uh, senior citizens and young children. This creates a really potent risk of false arrest and wrongful imprisonment for uh, individuals from communities of color. And we're quite concerned that this sort of uh, biometric tracking will only continue to grow and be used for increasingly minor crimes if we do not ban it here in New York. We've seen a broad national um, movement towards banning facial recognition. We've seen a number of cities um, ban it, including a referendum in Portland, or uh, Portland, Maine, that banned it just uh, um, a week ago. And so we urge you to please uh, join us in uh, pushing for a comprehensive law enforcement ban on facial recognition. Um, and, and then lastly, with regards to facial recognition, I uh, wanted to address uh, S5687 and Assembly Bill 7790, which uh, um, target uh, the use of facial recognition by landlords. Um, and I was hoping, Fabian, that you could um, maybe uh, uh, talk a bit about your experience with facial recognition uh, and why you think it's so important to ban it in residential settings. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the bill that's in place kind of came um, out of just making Assemblywoman Walker and uh, Brad Holm and our uh, constituents in our fight against facial recognition. I come from a background where I was working on the front lines, on the ground, just making sure uh, my community was basically safe with um, a bunch of my neighbors and things like that. What had happened was because there's a lack of proper um, legislation that uh, either that doesn't hinder uh, landlords from being able to deploy these uh, unethical, biased, and borderline illegal um, surveillance technologies. And at the same time, there's nothing uh, legally in place that protects tenants um, from these deployments, we find ourselves in a position where a landlord tried to install facial recognition into our housing without really our consent or without our opinion or suggestions or anything like that. The only reason why we were able to even make a, a pushback effort was because our uh, the housing that I live in, which is Atlantic Towers, is rent stabilized. So the governing enterprise is DHCI, which is the Division of Housing and Community Renewal. And it was because of the um, mandatory survey that DHCR had to send out that we understood that our landlord was putting in this improvement, quote unquote, um, in the first place. Um, so the need to make sure that there's a legal stature to protect tenants is very important because a lot of times the relationships in terms of housing and surveillance technology is one that's very reactive where uh, community members don't have a part uh, don't have a part to be within the conversation and it seems as though like people lobbying and community organizing isn't um, considered important until there's a media uprise and a landlord's reputation is at stake or governing enterprise's um, reputation is at stake because that's the process that we went through in terms of pushing back was that because we didn't have the same money as our landlord and what we really had was power in numbers and power amongst our constituents such as Assemblywoman Walker and Senator Brad Hoyleman, we were able to affect the reputation of a landlord and DHCR as well and the startup company Stonelock Technology that was willing to deploy and uh, install their technology into our building. But it shouldn't have to take that type of tumultuous um, relationship of being reactive and constantly having to be in media spotlight in order to get attention and protection and having to be preeminent about um, protecting yourself. That relationship shouldn't have to happen. So hopefully with this legislation in place, we can move forward into a, a conversation where we're more community involved, not just amongst policing, but also amongst these types of sneaky relationships between landlords and housing. Um, hopefully that's... Yeah, and there's a clear uh, line of continuity between seeing these sorts of uh, systems deployed by landlords and then seeing uh, uh, just a pipeline to greater 
uh, police involvement, more arrests, more discriminatory uh, law enforcement response. And so there's really a, a quite a bit of continuity there. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll be sending around uh, a, a, a summary of all of these bills. Uh, we'll have the recording available for your offices, but, um, you know, really our hope is that, you know, we can uh, see the Senate and the Assembly coming together uh, in the coming year to really take a stance on these sorts of law enforcement abuses and, you know, as part of a broader effort to protect New Yorkers' privacy and to push back against the worst forms of discriminatory policing. Um, so with that, um, you know, I know we've gone over a lot quite quickly uh, and, and I would just um, want to leave the, the bulk of time open for any questions you might have, any concerns, um, any other uh, any other feedback? All right, well, we know it can be difficult to chime in via Zoom, so we'll give folks just another second, but, you know, just want to reiterate that our office is available, our, uh, um, other coalition partners are available to provide supplemental briefing if you have any questions, any concerns, if there's any, uh, uh, you know, especially as we see more momentum on these bills and potentially push back for uh, potential amendments, happy to go through uh, why, um, you know, the language has been uh, drafted the way it has uh, for most of these measures. And, and really just want to be a uh, point of support um, along with our other coalition members in helping you, uh, you know, fight for these protections and helping, uh, you know, really address any other emerging uh, privacy threats that, that your offices are aware of. Um, so with that, uh, we'll just, uh, we'll uh, bring the briefing to a conclusion. Just ask, uh, sorry, uh, I do see a, a question if we know of any opposition to these bills. So we expect that there will be resistance from the NYPD to the vast majority of these bills. They have continued to defend their use of facial recognition, their use of uh, drones if they are, uh, and basically all of the surveillance tools that we have described. Um, they've been, you know, uh, the prior police commissioner was quite uh, vocal in, uh, in defending those practices. You know, with regards to the contact tracing bill, we're not aware of any uh, opponents uh, who are fighting it. Uh, similarly, um, uh, with regards to uh, the geofence warrant uh, ban, while we um, do know that this practice has been used by um, the, uh, Cy Vance's office and uh, by other law enforcement uh, agencies in New York State, we haven't seen any explicit opposition to the legislation, though we would expect, since this is a, a tool that they use, that they would oppose it. Similarly, we would expect opposition from all of the police unions, particularly the Sergeant Benevolent Association. Uh, but, you know, we are not aware of any grassroots organizations or other organizations that have taken a stance against the use of these uh, invasive and biased uh, technologies. Uh, happy to answer any other questions and any other concerns, anything else that would be helpful. Going once, going twice. All right. Well, again, you you will all have our contact information and uh, other points of contact uh, with the Privacy in New York Coalition. Really need to make clear that this has been a, a really broad-based effort by a, such a large number of groups and continues only to grow as we see uh, increasing uh you know, energy around uh, these privacy issues across New York State and across the country. So uh, please don't hesitate to reach out if there's any other way that we or the other uh, coalition members can be of help. And we look forward to working with all of your offices to help uh, transform New York into a more privacy-minded and rights-protective state. So th thank you so much and hope you have a great day.